There's no help for those who refuse it. If you're in a house and that house is on fire and I were to rush in to try and get you out of that house, but you fought me and you'd even denied that there was a fire to begin with, I can't help you. Now, sure, I could knock you out and carry you out of there against your will, but that's not God's style. God wants people to know that there is a fire, a raging fire that will consume everything that is not saved. But God is not going to force people's hands and turn them into automatons just to get them where he wants them to be. Now, we know that God's desire is that not one soul be lost. But God also wants free will employed for people to choose to serve him and to willingly turn away from sinfulness. Now, he could force our hands, take away free will, and remove our choice, but that's not what he wants. Sadly, for far too many, there is a raging fire, and their entire house is being consumed. But even though there's help right there on the scene, crying out, come to me and I will free you from your destruction, there are many who say, Jesus, I don't need you. I can do this on my own. I just need a little more time here. Leave me alone. There isn't really any danger. I'm fine. We as a people tend to hate to be told, you're wrong. We hate to be corrected or to be told that there might be a better way. When we're growing up and our parents told us they didn't like our friends, many of us chose to hang out with those people even more, simply out of defiance to our parents. When our father told us to use a shovel a certain way, many of us argued back that our way was better because we felt like we didn't need correction. Most arguments between parents and children, bosses and employees, spouses with each other, all stem from a single point of issue. We don't like correction. And the same is true for many of the breakdowns in churches. Yeah, that's right. Even in church, we don't like to be told that something we are doing is wrong. This is one of the key reasons that so many churches today have broken from telling the truth to telling a watered-down gospel. We don't want to offend, and we don't want to be offended. So instead, we choose to offend God. Hi, I'm Blaine Shields, and we've been looking at the book of Malachi, and today we're going to be looking at Malachi verse, chapters 3 through 4. Now, today is Tuesday, May 25th, 2021, and I want to welcome you to today's Bible study. But before we get into the Word of God, let's turn our attention to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the countless blessings that you pour out for us. Father, we thank you for your love and your mercy. We thank you, Father, that you don't give up on us. But Father, we also thank you for free will, for the opportunity to choose who we want to be and who we want to serve. Father, it's both a blessing and a curse because we know that so many choose poorly. They choose to turn away from you. They choose to chase after their desires of the flesh. They choose to chase after their own free will. They choose to follow after folly. Oh, Father, help us to choose to follow you. Father, I would just ask that you would drive us to you and drive us to our knees. Father, help us to see that we are sinners, that we are broken, and that we need your healing, your restoration, your grace, your mercy, your love, your forgiveness. Drive us to you, Father. Help us to lead others to you, to help others to see that there is a greater choice than the choice this world offers. 
There are greater treasures than the treasures of this world. And help us, Father, to be who you've called us to be through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, now and forevermore. We pray this in his name. Amen. Beginning at chapter 3 of the book of Malachi, it says, Look, I'm sending my messenger on ahead to clear the way for me. Suddenly, out of the blue, the leader that you've been looking for will enter his temple. Yes, the messenger of the covenant, the one you've been waiting for. Look, he's on his way. A message from the mouth of God of the angel armies. But who will be able to stand up to that coming? Who can survive his appearance? He'll be like white-hot fire from the smelter's furnace. He'll be like the strongest lye soap at the laundry. He'll take his place as a refiner of silver, as a cleanser of dirty clothes. He'll scrub the Levite priests clean, refine them like gold and silver until they're fit for God, fit to present offerings of righteousness. Then, and only then, will Judah and Jerusalem be fit and pleasing to God, as they used to be in the years long ago. Yes, I'm on my way to visit you with judgment. I'll present compelling evidences against sorcerers, adulterers, liars, those who exploit workers, those who take advantage of widows and orphans, those who are inhospitable to the homeless, anyone and everyone who doesn't honor me. A message from God of the angel armies. I am God. Yes, I am. I haven't changed. And because I haven't changed, you, the descendants of Jacob, haven't been destroyed. You have a long history of ignoring my commands. You haven't done a thing I've told you. Return to me so I can return to you, says God of the angel armies. You ask, but how do we return? Begin by being honest. Do honest people rob God? But you rob me day after day. You ask, how have we robbed you? The tithe and the offering, that's how. And now you're under a curse. The whole lot of you, because you're robbing me. Bring your full tithe to the temple treasury, so there will be ample provisions in my temple. Test me in this, and you will see if I don't open up heaven itself to you and pour out blessings beyond your wildest dreams. For my part, I will defend you against the marauders, protect your wheat fields and your vegetable gardens against plunderers. The message of God of the angel armies. You'll be voted happiest nation. You'll experience what it's like to be a country of grace. God of the angel armies says so. God says, you have spoken hard, rude words to me. You ask, but when did we ever do that? When you said it doesn't pay to serve God, what do we ever get out of it? When we did what he said and went around with long faces serious about God of the angel armies, what difference did it make? Those who take life into their own hands are the lucky ones. They break all the rules and they get away with it. They push God to the limit and they get by with that. Then those who were, whose lives honored God got together and they talked it over. God saw what they were doing and listened in. A book was opened in God's presence and minutes were taken of the meeting with the names of the God-fearers written down. All the names of those who honored God's name. God of the angel army said, They're mine, all mine. They'll get special treatment when I go into action. I treat them with the same consideration and kindness that parents give the child who honors them. Once more, you'll see the difference it makes between being a person who does the right thing and one who doesn't. Between serving God and not serving him. All right, in chapter 2, the audience that Malachi is addressing charge God with being unfair. They challenge God that he should be bringing down justice upon those who are ungodly and those who oppose Israel. 
Now, sometimes it's easy for us to seek out for those who oppose us or those that we think oppose us, those that we think of as evil, to be judged harshly by God. But we miss the fact that we aren't entirely righteous ourselves. When we call for judgment from God, it's important to remember the words of Jesus when he said, judge not unless you're ready to be judged as well. Because in the same way that you judge others, you will be judged. And before you go in to remove the stick from your brother's eye, first get the plank out of your own eye. God is impartial on judgment. Sin is sin. When the people of Israel cried out for God to judge, God said, okay. And let's deal with the sinfulness, the greed, the lust, the pride, the arrogance, the worship of false gods, the divorces of, and the marrying into other faiths, and so forth that you have going on for yourselves while we're at it. God pointed out that one of the greatest issues that the priests and the people had going on was summed up in one word, unfaithful. In chapter 3, God continues this message through Malachi, charging forth into a dialogue with his people. And along the way, the people bring charges, and God responds. And the people are asking, but surely not us. When did we do that? You know, I'm reminded of having conversations with my kids in which one child will come in and begin to go off about how their sibling was being so cruel to them, and how I needed to do something about their behavior. So then comes the question, and some of you may be familiar with this. Yeah, but what did you do? Of course, child one has the response of, I didn't do anything. I'm innocent. But after some discussion, it turns out that child one had done something to provoke child two. Was child two wrong for their behavior? Absolutely. Was child one also at fault? You know, the answer to that is, absolutely as well. And again, no one likes to be told they are wrong or that they need corrected. So too we see in chapter 3 as God lays out that the people who are called his own had been stealing from him, cheating, defiling the office of their priesthood, groaning and complaining about how the godless seem to get by with everything while the godly aren't helped, defiling their marriage vows, and seeking divorce from their Jewish wives so they could chase after women of neighboring tribes who serve false gods, refusing to speak truth in order to water down scripture, failing to bring their full and honorable tithe and sacrifice, and instead giving God the leftovers. And the list goes on and on. And God says, look, I take care of those who honor me. I care for them and I provide for them. I protect them and I strengthen them. But you come to me pleading innocence and injustice. You cry out that you're being poorly treated. But how are you treating me? Where is your tithe? Where is your service? Where is your faithfulness? Where are your vows? Where is your heart? I will bring justice, but just remember, justice is impartial. Justice is fair. Just to cease truth. How much like this are we? Crying out for God to do his part while failing to do our own. We claim to be his, but then we set a time limit for how much of our week God gets. And it's usually on Sunday from 10 to 12 and no later than that. And how much of what we have does God get? You see, legalism abounds when it comes to tithing. And how much of our heart do we give to God? After all, I have lots of other things that I love and desire, so I'll chase after the riches of this earth all day, and I'll chase after God on Sunday when it's appropriate and required. You see, we too suffer from a faith issue. Continuing at Malachi 4, it says, Count on it. The day is coming, raging like a forest fire. All the arrogant people who do evil will be burnt up like stove wood, burned to a crisp. Nothing will be left but scorched earth and ash, a black day. But for you, sunrise, the sun of righteousness will dawn on those who honor my name, healing, radiating from his wings. 
You will be bursting with energy, like colts, frisky and frolicking, and you'll tromp on the wicked. There'll be nothing but ashes under your feet on that day. God of the angel armies says so. Remember and keep the revelation I gave through my servant Moses, the revelation I commanded at Horeb for all of Israel, all the rules and procedures for right living. But also look ahead. I'm sending Elijah, the prophet, to clear the way for the big day of God, the decisive judgment day. He will convince parents to look after their children and children to look up to their parents. And if they refuse, I'll come and put their land under a curse. Now, something that we too often avoid, even in church, is talk about the end time and judgments. We follow up what, Ma, what, what Malachi described about the priest in chapter 2. We argue that God will not allow anyone to be destroyed because God is love. He won't judge sin because God loves both the sinner and the sin, right? Well, too many live their lives as if there will be no judgment. They live their lives as though there is no hell. And it's just something mentioned in passing to frighten the children, to keep them uh, saying their prayers at night and eating their vegetables. But the Word of God is very clear on all of this. Hell is real. Judgment is real. Living like things of hell and judgment aren't real doesn't change the reality that they exist. The cost of choosing sin over God's love and mercy and his sacrifice of his son, the, the judgment will come and the cost is death. The cost of choosing to not accept Jesus as, as your Christ and as your Savior is eternal separation from God. The cost of choosing to cheat on God or to defile yourself with sin is to choose to burn. The cost of choosing to break your covenant is to be judged in your sin. But what if I were baptized and I committed myself to God? What if I accepted Jesus as my Savior and I acknowledged him as the Christ of God? That's great. And if you meant it, God knows it. But here's the thing. Accepting Jesus is not a free pass to live your life however you want to. God's very clear about it. All that is sinful will be burnt away. All that is impure will be turned to dross and stripped away in refinement. Though the priests were servants of God, they had turned after their own pursuits. They had contaminated their faith and the faith of those that they served and led. Jesus made a way for us to be saved, truly saved from the judgment to come. Accept him and follow him. But it's also possible that we may be saved from destruction only to be singed by the fires of judgment. Imagine, you arrive in heaven and God says, I see your name in the book of life. The book of those who are mine. Great news. Now, let's take a look at what you did and how you lived. Well, pour out your life on the altar and burn up all that is sinful and deceitful or evil in your life. All the lust, the pride, the hate, the cruelty, the spite, the lies, the unfaithfulness. What is left is what you have as your treasure stored up. What's burned up is gone forever. And you watch as the fire takes away all that is sin. The question is, how much is left? How much have you built up? How much has been stored away like refined silver? A challenge for each of us is this. Yes, you will make mistakes. Yes, you will sin. Yes, you will fail and you will fall. David fell many times. Remember Bathsheba? Yet David was still called a man after God's own heart. Why? Because it isn't just about the times that we fall. It's about where we turn when we do. No excuses, no whining, no crying that things are just too hard and it's unfair, but turning around from where you are to face God and fall on your knees and cry out, Father, forgive me. 
Paul declared himself chief of all sinners, and Paul was a powerful emissary for God. But Paul also didn't give himself a free pass and say, and as a sinner, I'll just continue to do what I know I shouldn't because, after all, God is going to forgive me. No, Paul's response was to recognize that he often does what he knows he shouldn't, but to seek forgiveness for where he falls short and to push on towards the goal of heaven. Don't let the enemy trick you into thinking that you're going to fail, so just go ahead and do it. Don't let the enemy trick you into thinking that you get by living however you want and expect to escape the judgment to come because you're carrying out on the coattails of others who went before you. Don't let the enemy trick you into believing that God is love. Now, he is by the way. But don't confuse that for blind love that fails to recognize truth and that he wouldn't allow anyone to be burnt up or condemned to hell. God is truth. God is love. God is just. God is holy. Holiness, by nature, cannot abide in the presence of sin, nor can sin abide in the presence of holiness. Justice cannot abide with injustice nor can the unjust be called just. Truth cannot dwell within lies, nor can lies dwell within truth. And love? Love is not something that just turns a blind eye and is dumb to all things. Love is a very powerful thing, but love also recognizes that free will means that you can choose to not love, not accept, and not respond to God. It comes down to choice. Choice is something that everyone wants to clamor after today. I have the freedom to choose, and so we make our life choices. What no one wants to hear is that for every choice, there's also some consequences. Now, some of these consequences are good. And I chose to try the new Key Lime Kit Kat bar, and I have to say, the consequence was it was delicious. Some consequences, not so good. Choosing to live apart from God results in eternal damnation in the lake of fire. I'm reminded of the scene on Indiana Jones where Indy and the bad guy that he was confronting were both confronted with a choice about which chalice was the one that Christ drank from. Now, the bad guy reaches up and he takes the one which is gold and it's fitted with gems. It looked beautiful, like something princely. And as he drank from it, he quickly meets an unsightly doom. The knight who was watching over the chalices looks at Indy, and his response was, He chose poorly. Don't be the one who chooses poorly because you are lured in by the world and its lies. Choose Christ. Live for him. Repent from your sins every time. And seek first the kingdom of God in all things. Remember, You are loved. God bless.